So tonight brings us to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 6, as we are uh, nearing the end of Paul's uh, section uh, by which he confronts some false teachers, arrogant fellows, self-promoters in Corinth by showing the folly of boasting, which tells us that it must have been one of their primary methods uh, to advance themselves in their cause uh, was by just naked boasting and, and self-promotion. You know, when you're dealing with uh, folks who come in with various kind of errors or attacks or things out of line, uh, you need to respond to them somewhat in the field that uh, they are playing in, in the in, uh, by the rules of engagement and by the type of argument and advancement that they're engaging in. So if someone is engaging in an error or a, a false doctrine, uh, but they're doing it by making arguments from Scripture. Uh, of course, in that case, they would be wrongly using Scripture, uh, misapplying Scripture, uh, uh, unaware of the entirety of Scripture, if they're making it a, of good conscience, or maybe twisting Scripture, twisting it deliberately, if they're doing it of bad conscience. But if they're making an advancement on the basis of arguments from the text, then the text would be the place to meet them. Uh, when the Judaizers were uh, making their advancement uh, among the uh, churches of Galatia, and it's also that uh, error is met in the book of Romans, there's a number of times where the Apostle Paul will cite Scripture. He will turn to the text and says, but the Scripture says this, the text says that. There's no appeal to Scripture, uh, to the uh, Old Testament or uh, uh, teachings or writings or sayings of Jesus uh, in this section, because I don't think these guys were promoting themselves, promoting their cause, promoting their ideas uh, on a basis of thus says the Lord. It was, uh, but here's what I've got for you. Here's what I can offer you. Here's what you ought to do for me. And so it's much more personal. And so uh, here Paul, as I say, is ending and concluding the section of boasting, countering and discrediting those in Corinth who advance themselves and harm the brethren in this way. And in this concluding boast, I have to say, we have the world's strangest boast. The, the boast that Paul meets them with is that Satan had afflicted him, that he was weak in body, and that God turned down his prayer request. Right? Yeah, it is right. That's, that's what we'll read here in verses 6 through 10 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, that Satan afflicted him, that he was weak, he was tormented in body, and God turned him down when he prayed. That's a strange boast, but it illustrates the point that Paul wants to get, that the power and strength is in God. These people were advancing on the uh, supposed basis uh, of, of their own strength, of their own ability. And Paul says, that is not the way we have learned Christ. So uh, again, he had said verse 5, as we start tonight, verse 6, he had said verse 5, uh, after talking about uh, the vision was granted him to see into paradise, the third heaven, he said, of, of such a man I'll boast, but not on my own behalf, except in regard to my own weakness. So of that vision of, of the temple, Paul had anonymized it. He had not spoken it in his own name, saying, look at me, look where I, look where I got to go. He said, but I know a man in Christ. Now we're sure that man in Christ was Paul. But he had anonymized that. He had not attached his own name to that directly. But here's what he says, I'll put my name on. I'll boast of my weakness. And beginning in verse 6 through verse 10, it's the weakest boast in the history of mankind. Verse 6, for I do not wish to boast, he says, for I, or if I do wish to boast... I will not be foolish, for I am speaking the truth, but I refrain from this so that no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me. 
because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. For this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And so there, my friends, is the world's weakest boast to show the greatness of God. We wonder if a man's in this kind of situation, how does he even go go on? How does he get up in the morning? How did he accomplish anything? How did he get this church started? How did he go about preaching? He did it through the grace that God provided. I'm sure these Corinthian fellows, uh, they were uh, promoting themselves as having super access to God. That uh, if you're with me and I ask God, my God will get it to you. Uh, so support me, right? Like these uh, prosperity gospel preachers, right? Um, one of the worst things I've ever heard, but it's a common summary of their teaching is they, they say when you give your tithe, of course they bind the tithe, when you give your tithe to God, that's what's owed. But when you give to God's ministry, then they mean their ministry, uh, give to God through them. When you give to my ministry, then you're, that's when you're doing what you sow. So you, you know your normal tithes and offerings, that's just what you owe. But to grow, to sow, you need to give more. To me, well, these guys are of the same ilk that if you're with me, surely God will answer our prayers. I'll be praying with you and for you, of course, for a small cash donation. I will get you access. I will get you things. Stick with me. It'll go well with you. And Paul said, this is not, this is not what we want to say. This is not what the Scriptures teach. So in this text, he outlines himself in weakness, as tormented, as prayerful, but as refused, but also as content. And so let's be content in God with the grace that God has given us. Again, verse 6, for I do not wish to boast, he says, I, or if I do wish to boast, I'll not be foolish, uh, but I'll be speaking the truth. But I refrain from this, so I don't want to talk about me in the way that you guys talk about yourselves. And also, he says, I don't want anybody there in Corinth to take up that mantle for me. I don't need people there saying, you know, well, these guys said this, but hey, did you know Paul? And our Paul, our friend Paul, did that. And this is what God has done through him. Paul says, I don't want anyone to credit me with more than he sees in me or hears in me. I don't want people filling in the blanks and telling everybody how great I am to counter you guys as telling everybody how great you are. We, we don't need a stare down uh, of us, or, and we're not going to do that, he says, when I come. And we don't need, a, I don't need my people, I don't need them sticking up for me in that way either. We're not going to engage in this. And so I want everybody to just, here's what I say. Here's what you can see and hear in me. What do you see and hear in me? Because of the surpassing greatness of revelation, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. So he said, what you see, and I think they had seen this uh, in Paul, they had noticed that he had some physical ailments. But Paul said that was on purpose. Uh, God had a meaning in that. And it was to keep me from exalting myself. Well, when we think about Saul the persecutor, Saul the enraged one who was dragging off 
the brethren, men and women both, uh, to persecution, casting his vote against them for death, going house to house. I think we see a man full of himself, a man who was prone to much pride. I don't think he'd be the persecutor in chief. I don't know if that was his title. I like to imagine that was his title. Chief persecutor, uh, special persecutor. Uh, I don't know. Was he head investigator, special persecutions branch? Whatever the bureaucratic title would have been. But I don't think he could have that office, and he had the office of chief persecutor, whatever the title. I don't think he'd have that office without being very proud, without being very full of yourself. And so God knew what Paul needed, right? Now, Paul also, he, he said, I, 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 you know, I know the Scripture, right? You'd humble yourself uh, lest uh, God humble you. Uh, Jesus constantly taught, right, for us to, to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And Paul needed that too. He'd tell the Corinthians back in the first letter, chapter 9, I buffet my own body lest after I preach to others I should be a castaway or disqualified. So Paul, Paul says, I need that lesson, that I would not become proud. And he said, it actually, it could have, could have been easy to be proud because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. Well, we just had the revelation that he saw the vision of heaven that he anonymized and would not even ascribe to himself, although surely that was him. But he's also the man who wrote for us half the New Testament. He is one of the chief people in the history of mankind and God's working with men to redeem us that God chose to reveal his will through. I don't know who we could possibly say revealed more to us of the will of God other than Paul, except for Jesus himself. And so here is God's chief agent of revelation, and certainly in his age, he was the chief. Maybe we could find some of the prophet of the Old Testament from whom we get more words of revelation, more, more inspired uh, more inspired words that come through their pen than Paul. But even in a day when there were 12 apostles, Paul was chief among those in revealing the revelation of God. Half the words, basically, of our New Testament, yeah, it's not quite that, maybe 40%, because when you add up Luke and Acts, it's a huge chunk. Uh, but here is our revelator-in-chief. used to be persecutor-in-chief. Now he's our revelator-in-chief. And God says, I don't want him to be exalted in his own mind. I don't want him to think too much of himself. And so God knew the balance of how useful Paul could be. But he also uh, knew what Paul needed. And so I think about uh, you know various tools I have. We were talking about Revelation here, the inspired word. I think about various tools I have for writing, right? And uh, the back when we used pencils a lot, and I grew up back in the days of the number two pencil. There were certain types of number two pencils that I preferred, certain browns of pencil for certain reasons. But I also knew when it was time to sharpen them and when it was time to dispose of them, what it took to make these pencils work optimally. And, and now I'm a little bit, I don't have the budget to really go full in on it, but I'm a little bit of a pen snob. I hate cheap pens. Just can't stand cheap pens. I have a whole big container of cheap pens in my office, but they're over there by the door for the men who do the announcements to pick up one of those cheap pens and fill out that little sheet of paper for doing the announcements. And I don't worry myself in the least if the pen comes back or not, because it's a pen I don't want to use. But on my desk, in a certain spot, there's a couple of really good pens, and at times at my desk, there might be a set of fountain pens even. And there's one particular uh, pen that I can tell you much more about, both its, uh, uh, its metal uh, uh, construction, uh, the uh, special uh, uh, inserts, the cartridges it needs to work, the reason why this pen needs to be a desk pen and not put in your pocket, because it, 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 it gives ink freely and my wife does not like it when I have big uh, spots of free ink on my shirt pockets. Those are kind of hard to get out, if at all. But 
I know how to use my pins. I know which one's for which task. And I know uh, when to make a change in them. I know all sorts of things about my pins. Well, here the Lord, he knows about his agents of revelation. He knows where a change needs to be made, where a rough spot needs to be smoothed down. He knows where this, uh, uh, this can be pushed in this way for this task, but no more. And in some cases, I need a different instrument for a different task. Paul here is the instrument of God, the willing instrument of God, the faithful instrument of God. But he could become unuseful. He could become ruined. We've all had favorite writing instruments that something happened to them, and they were no longer useful for what we wanted. Paul wants to be useful for God, and God wants Paul to be useful to him. Paul, in pride, could disqualify himself. As he said, again, 1 Corinthians 9.27, he made sure he did not become disqualified. Well, the Lord was helping him. And in this case, the Lord was helping him with lessons in humility. And the lesson in humility came, Paul says, in response to the greatness of revelation, there would be the cause of pride if that was to get out of control. That would be a likely source of it. But the cure for that, then, was a thorn in the flesh. So there was something wrong with Paul's body. There was something about, you know, his, uh, his physical self that was not right. And he says of two things about this. He says it was a thorn in the flesh. It was a, mer- it was a messenger of Satan to torment me. Other translations might say to buffet me or to humble me or to assail me. It was something that afflicted Paul to the place of torment. Don't know what it was, but it was tormenting in the body. Many have thought, uh, as Paul wrote to the Galatians, that he came and preached to them, he says, because of bodily illness. And he tells them that they did not uh, despise or loathe him. This is Galatians 4.13. It was because of bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you the first time. Verse 14 of Galatians 4, it was a trial to you in my body, my bodily condition that you did not despise or loathe. So whatever was going on with Paul in his preaching in the Galatian area, it was a trial, not just for him. It was a trial for others. He said, it was a trial for you in my bodily condition. And he said, you didn't loathe me. Now, I've seen people suffer from all different signs of terrible things that I wouldn't want to suffer from in the least. And other than hopefully pains of sympathy, uh, most of the time other people's uh, affliction doesn't bother me. But there are some times when you see somebody with an affliction that it will bother you, right? Uh, So I don't think too much about this, but I think for a moment, uh, what if somebody has a grievous open wound? or a festering and seeping wound? Or or what if somebody has a terribly inflamed and red eye that stuff is... Okay, so we wouldn't talk about this too long. Paul must have had something like that when he was with the Galatians. He may have had it as well with the Corinthians. And the reason I brought up eyes is in Galatians 4, 15... Paul says, I bear witness, if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. And so whatever was going on in the Galatian time of preaching, it seems pretty obvious it had to do with eyes. And people thought, he could use these eyes more than I can use them. Let me give him an eye. Of course, we can't do that now, much less in ancient times. But... What must that have been, that you didn't loathe me and you would offer me an eye? And yet he came as the messenger of God. The health and wealth preachers, 
I don't know how they continue to do that for a lifetime when they get old. Because after a while, you, you see people, it's like, you know, that guy's getting old. He doesn't look so healthy anymore. Doesn't it just show that there's a lie to that? That's not actually what God's promising. But Paul would have never got started in that line of work. Because as soon as, you know, maybe he could have preached the wealth gospel, but evidently he could have never preached the health gospel. And whatever this was, was tormenting to Paul. It would cause others to loathe the sight of him. It caused him torment. He said it was something wrong with his flesh. He also says this is a messenger of Satan. And this gives us an interesting pause. A messenger of Satan. Well, Paul was having such success turning people from Satan to God that it appears that Satan struck back. That Satan did something to hinder Paul. This is something that would accomplish Satan's work, Satan's will, Satan's desires, if allowed to continue or if allowed to to uh, uh, increase. And so here's the thing that Satan intended, it appears, to harm Paul. But here's the very thing that God used for his purpose to keep Paul from exalting himself. And so Paul did not go into the woe is me about this. Paul did not go into the, well, if God loved me, he'd cure me about this. He took it for the lesson that God intended. And so what we note in this one thing, then, is both the action of Satan and of God, and very much overlapping action, that what God allowed <clears throat> and what Satan <clears throat> provoked with was the same thing, the same torment of body. Now, they were intended for entirely different purposes, but it was the same instrument, the same thorn in the flesh, the same loathsome condition of body, the same tormenting action, one used to hinder, to destroy, the other used to uh, teach valuable spiritual lessons so the man would be useful in the field all the longer. And so Satan and God, for different purposes, are active in the same action. It's very similar to what we find from the story of Joseph, of course, most famously, that his brothers were desired to kill him. <laughs> that wasn't the holy or righteous or good thing. They end up not killing him, only selling him to slavery for decades. And through that, he was raised by God to a great place in Egypt, and he became the savior of the people in that generation from the famine. And he said to his brothers, <laughs> when it was all worked through and the, the thing was done, he said, looking back on it, he said, you intended this for evil, but God intended it for good. And so here we have the same thing with the thorn in the flesh. Satan intended that for evil. Satan intended that just to torment, to discourage. God intended that for good, for humility and learning about his grace. And so, can we rightly say about terrible things, well, this is the will of God? I think often so. Can we say about terrible and evil things, the same terrible and evil things? Can we say this was Satan trying to hurt and harm and hinder us? I think we can often. We can say that too. And so for different purposes, for different ends, one to destruction and one to glory, the messenger of Satan and the allowance of God worked at the same time. Paul said about this, concerning this I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And so he's tormented, and Paul's response is prayerfulness. That's the right response, right? When we go to God, we're certainly showing our dependence upon God. We're not being proud and full of ourselves. We're showing our dependence on God. That is the kind of humility that keeps one in the path of faithfulness. And so he was prayerful, and he was prayerful repeatedly repeatedly. 
he went three different times. Recall this was, he said, a torment. If you were being tormented, how many times would you pray? And so God told him, God told him, my grace is sufficient for you. Power is perfected in weakness. God's answer was, my grace will get you through. The weakness that you're having, in that we'll see my surpassing power. But then we repeat that twice and a third time. Because again, God's message is, my grace is good enough. My grace is enough. My grace is enough. But if you'd heard that, and then you continue to be tormented, would you not ask yet again? You would, I think. We all would. And would you not ask a third time? I think all of us who haven't given up on prayer would. It, it tells us, it shows us here, don't give up on prayer. It shows us in every circumstance, keep praying. Now, Paul had a direct line. He had a direct answer. I don't think we're often going to get that. But we got Paul in his circumstance and his relationship and closeness to God showing us the way in which God works. And so we might expect it to work similar ways in our lives. And so let us be prayerful and let us be continually prayerful. And the fact that this torment continued was not a sign that the love of God was lacking. It was not a sign that God's provision uh, was, was woeful. It was not a sign that the Apostle Paul was rejected. It was actually God was working through this, that God knew, and God didn't let it be too much for Paul to handle, but that Paul would go to him in prayer, and Paul would be reminded of important lessons. I've actually seen, I heard it, and unfortunately not all that long ago, I actually heard somebody preach that Paul was in error here in going back to pray again and again after God already told him, my grace is enough. It's like, I hope you don't have a long-term condition, buddy. I hope that nothing torments you for a lengthy period of time. Because, I mean, after you prayed for it once and you didn't get it, I guess it must be God's will that you have it, right? I eh, thought that was a bad conclusion to draw. But in any case, notice here what Paul's bragging about, what he's boasting about. I was afflicted. Satan got a hold of me in my body, not my mind, not my faith. But Satan got a hold of me, and God wouldn't answer my prayer in the affirmative that it be lifted. And so Paul says, I was refused. Now, this at this point is when a lot of people give up. That they they're in torment, they're in trouble. It vexes them, it strains them that this is there. That they have prayed. And with the prayerful expectation, faithful expectation that God will help and God's a loving God, they're expecting a positive outcome, a positive answer. And I think some of us are refused for greater purposes for our good or other purposes of God for other people's goods or just things that God knows that we don't, that when the refusal comes or when the blessing is delayed, and any time it's delayed, we think maybe it's being denied. And while it's being delayed, we don't know if it's been denied or not. It may turn out to be a greater blessing later. How many times is that true in the book? But we don't know. And so we get to the tormented and the prayerful and refused part, and then we break. We falter. And that's what Satan's trying to do. Let us be like Paul and learn the lesson from God. He says, most gladly, therefore, having been told power is perfected in weakness, verse 9, most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so the power of Christ may dwell in me. And he, so he says, I'm going to be content. 
I will boast about my weakness. I have this weakness. I'll let you know. I'll tell you about it. I don't need to hide it. Actually, if this loathsome medical thing, this loathsome bodily condition was such that the Galatians could see it right there on his face, I suppose others could too. I mean, so many times we try to deny the things that are just obvious. Well, here, no, there's no denying. It's obvious. There's a problem. Paul's body's weak. But he says, I'll boast in that weakness that the power of Christ may dwell in me. When we're full of ourselves, there's not much room left for Christ. This was to keep him from exalting himself. Paul would empty himself in his request to God for this to be removed. Paul would learn in all things to empty himself, rely not on his own strength and power, and all these things. Going back to chapter 10, all those perils of various kinds and, and afflictions, he would learn all these things to depend upon God so that Christ's power could fill him, that the Spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, could become resident in Paul as a vessel prepared for God's service. And when we are still stuck on our service and uh, our desires, where's the room for Christ? So many have been hindered from good and faithful service by having too much of themselves filling the vessel that God might otherwise use. So he says, I'm content. I'm content with weakness. Now, this I'm content in weakness, this reminds us of another very famous passage about Paul and how he lives his life uh, in this world. Philippians 4.13, the famous passage, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He goes on to say, I've learned the secret of being content. It's a, That's a passage also about contentment. The contentment there of living in abundance or living in want. He was talking particularly in that context about the Philippians supporting him in preaching the gospel. And sometimes he preached the gospel with a full pocketbook, and sometimes he preached it with an empty belly. And I think of the two, he would have preferred the pocketbook being full, and so the belly being full too. But he said, I've learned the secret of being content in any circumstance. And that's the, in that context, particularly, it's having plenty or having want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The all things there in context is about the circumstances of life. I can be content through the power of Christ, no matter what my outward circumstance. That's not a passage about um, you know how strong you can be if you're in Christ, necessarily, especially in the sense of not how physically strong. I, I recall the uh, from many years ago, this uh, Christian powerlifting team who go about ripping phone books in half and lifting heavy weights and taking uh, water bottles and inflating them with their lungs like they were balloons until they burst. And they go, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's <sighs> not what it means. But it also does apply to many aspects of life. It's the same here. Being content, and that passage of Philippians 4 is also about being content. Being content in the things that God provides. If God provides them, they must be enough. What's our promise? Seek first the kingdom and the glory, his glory. All these things be provided unto you. Trust that God will provide. If this is what I've got, this is what God has provided. Now, that's not saying don't save, don't put something in your retirement. That's not saying blow all your money today. God will give you more tomorrow. It's none of that. Be wise. Be a good steward, but trust that the Lord will provide. Well, here in all these things, including whatever he needed of health, whatever he needed of physical strength, whatever he needed of deliverance, whatever he needed, God provided for him. So he'd be content in weakness. Again, these, these fellows he's arguing about, these Corinthians who, by self-promotion, got themselves to a strong position among the brethren where they could misuse the brethren and profit from the brethren. These guys weren't going to tell you when they were weak. Their, their whole position was, we are strong. Their whole position was, this is what I can do, or this is how God will answer me. 
this is what I can get from God and give to you. There was no weakness there. And so they were so full of themselves, they're not full of Christ. Again, Paul says, I will boast about my weakness that the power of Christ may dwell. So I'm content with my weakness. Again, verse 10, with insults, with distress, with persecution, with difficulty. Summarizing all the things, going back to chapter 10. Do, do we suffer? Sure. We do it for and in Christ. Are we distressed? Where are these, these shipwrecks? Where are there these persecutions? Have I been thrown in prison? Did I have all kinds of difficulties? Yes. But in all that, we saw and should see Christ. So he does it all, he says, for Christ's sake. That doesn't mean we just make things intentionally difficult on us. I don't think Paul would ever out of his way to make something difficult for him or others in any respect. But he did go out of his way to show at all times Christ. So he says in the great paradox, when I am weak, I am strong. When I am weak, then I'm strong. He's weak in Paul, but he's strong in Christ. Of course, the opposite of that would be when he's strong in Paul, he's weak in Christ. And that's the lesson for us. So whatever was brought in his life in God, whether that was good or ill to the body, or going to Philippians 4, uh, whether that brought uh, rich, richness or poorness to the pocketbook, or whether that brought acclaim, or whether that brought shame in the mind of other people, he's just always going to do Christ. He's going to, by the grace of God through Jesus Christ, he's going to live in him. Right? Galatians 2.20, right? No, I've been crucified in Christ, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So this is the end of the boasting. In the world's worst boast, I was weak, I was sick, I prayed and God turned me down. That's my boast. You want me to boast? That's my boast. Now he's going to turn to more direct line of conversation to finish this up in the rest of chapter 12, verse 11. I have become, if I become foolish, he says, you've compelled me. Actually, he says, I should have been commended by you, for in no respect was I inferior to the most eminent of apostles, even though I'm a nobody. But you want to know what kind of nobody I was? The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with all perseverance. That's the kind of nobody I was. The one that brought you the power of God continually in miracles. So maybe y'all should have had a different attitude toward me. All right, well, that'll be next time as we conclude 